Hey everyone, let's get straight to the core. In science, we're now seeing that everything that we think of as reality is a big infinite field of vibrating quantum energy. Now quantum in layman's terms means very small increments into which many forms of energy are divided. Thus, we can see that everything is made up of vibrating molecules. And those molecules are made up of atoms, also vibrating. And those atoms are made up of even more tinier particles with vast amounts of empty space in between, all vibrating, all spinning around and moving, all of the time. Scientists around the world are just beginning to understand this, and our understanding of it is growing every day. This concept lays the foundation for what you're about to see today. And just think about this while you're watching. Every moment, while you breathe, while your heart pumps your blood, while your nervous system carries electrical signals, while the atoms in your body spin, everything is in constant motion, and this motion emanates a field around it. And all of the motion of all of these particles and all of these waves are all connected in this field. Even something that appears dead or inanimate, such as a crystal or a dead rat. Once you reach a certain level, there are countless particles moving in waves constantly through this seemingly non-living thing. This moving field concept, it has had many names over the aeons. Names including the source field, the unified field pertaining to the unified field theory. We've heard the God source consciousness field, which is kind of way off in that new age left field. But in the end, we've decided that for the sake of brevity and to keep it simple, for now, we're just gonna call it the field. It's all semantics anyways. Before we begin, we are honored to give a very special thanks to both David Wilcock for his mind, his heart, and his book, The Source Field Investigations, as well as Lynn McTaggart for her spirit, her wisdom, and her book, The Field. Both texts are cited regularly during this video and comprise much of and much more of the research that we are presenting to you today. Now this topic opens the doors to so many topics, including zero point energy, pyramid power, or people who practice energy work directly in order to facilitate healing. But before we can get there, we have to back up and ask the very first question. What is the field? Quantum field theory is one modern name for many ancient teachings which stretch back way into ancient Egypt and Greece. Though today it exists as a branch of quantum theoretical physics and really owes much of its modern Western adaption to researcher and interrogation specialist, Cleve Baxter. However, Baxter didn't set out to find scientific evidence on some mystical energy that exists around everything. No, he was interested in the human mind and its effects while under hypnosis. There are some amazing stories about hypnosis out there. Hypnosis has been used to help people heal or even have instantaneous out-of-body experiences. There's one hypnosis story in particular that we love, which comes from Michael Talbot's The Holographic Universe, where a hypnotist had a father look through his daughter's belly to read an inscription on a pocket watch in front of a live audience. According to the father, he didn't even know his daughter was on stage, let alone directly in between his eyes and the watch he was reading. This experiment alone changes everything that we think of about solid matter. And Baxter's experiences with hypnosis are equally as amazing. It was in a similar experiment that he hypnotized a CIA agent to retrieve and give to him a classified document without even knowing it had happened. It was because of this experiment in particular that his studies connected him with the CIA, after which led him to the use of the polygraph machine, also commonly known as a lie detector machine. Now, for those who don't know, a polygraph is a very simple mechanism which records sensory information from the body in real time, such as blood pressure, pulse, respiration, and skin conductivity. Traditionally, you're able to observe when someone is lying through the polygraph because when someone lies, their heart rate and blood pressure increases and you see strong spikes in the readout as opposed to normal activity. Now we know today that a polygraph machine is not the most accurate way of identifying whether someone is actually lying or not because just by slowing your heart rate and breathing and staying very calm, one can actually trick the polygraph into thinking that you're always telling the truth. However, Cleve Baxter used it for a different purpose. Cleve Baxter was fascinated by polygraphs and later on in life actually founded the Baxter School of Lie Detection, located in San Diego, California. But the exciting part of the story occurs much before then, in a time when he got the idea to test the biorhythms of something other than a human and hooked his lie detector up to a plant. Now, one might expect the pulse of a plant to be rather a consistent thing and not at all very interesting to study. But thank heavens that Baxter was a curious fellow because he made the most incredible discovery, which even today we are still having a hard time processing the ramifications of. It all happened when he attached his Dracaena plant to a polygraph, and he discovered its electrical signals were very much alive and fluctuating, the opposite of what he had expected. Baxter wrote, About one minute into the chart reading, the tracing exhibited a short-term change in contour, similar to a reaction pattern typical of a human subject who might have just briefly experienced the fear of detection. Basically, he described the plant seemed to, for a moment, become aware that it was not the only one in the room. 
Baxter knew that if you wanted to catch someone lying, you first have to confront them about whatever they might be hiding. If your questions cause them to feel threatened or anxious, the electrical activity in their skin gets much stronger. Baxter wanted to see if he could get a human-like response out of his new plant buddy by threatening its well-being somehow. First, he tried dipping one of the leaves into a hot cup of coffee and tapped on the leaves with his pen. There was hardly any response. He tried several other things, but to no avail. Hmm. Pacing around the room, eventually he had this thought. Aha, I shall get a match and burn the leaf. At that time, the plant was about 15 feet away from where he was standing. The only new thing that occurred was the thought. The very moment the imagery of burning that leaf entered into Baxter's mind, the polygraph recording pen moved rapidly to the top of the chart. No words were spoken, no touching of the plant, no lighting of matches, just clear intention to burn the leaf. The plant recording showed dramatic excitement as if very afraid. Baxter then recorded the following statement. I must state that on February 2nd, 1966, at 13 minutes, 55 seconds into that chart recording, my whole consciousness changed. I then thought, gee, it's as though this plant just read my mind. Baxter went into a flurry. He connected yogurt bacteria, ordinary unfertilized chicken eggs from his refrigerator, and even live human cells to his polygraph and continued to get stunning results. Consistently, what he found over and over was that every living thing is intimately attuned to its environment. When any stress, suffering, or death occurs, all the life forms in the surrounding area have an immediate electrical response as if they all share the pain. Baxter wanted to make sure that the information that was passed to and from his mind to the plant was not done through known electromagnetic frequencies such as microwaves or radio waves. So he continued testing on various living things and he had his test subjects contained in Faraday cages to block electrical signals and then later using a state-of-the-art shielded room. And still he was able to prove that there was no detectable connections between the subject and still get the response. What's even more amazing, he found out that it would work regardless of distance. He did one notable test with NASA astronaut, Dr. Brian O'Leary in 1988, who served on the faculties of Cornell University, California Institute of Technology, the University of California, and Princeton University. Baxter took a saliva sample from O'Leary, who then left for the San Diego airport to fly to Phoenix, Arizona, some 300 miles away. They synchronized watches, and then Dr. O'Leary's saliva cells were monitored in the lab the entire time. These cells were only able to stay alive for 10 to 12 hours, but still, Baxter was able to detect spikes in the activity of O'Leary's cells when O'Leary nearly missed his flight, as the plane took off, and again as it landed, and when O'Leary's son failed to meet him at the airport. His own mind was broadcasting waves of information that were being picked up by his living cells in a lab 300 miles away, as if they were still inside of his mouth. The effect works just as well if the cells are kept in a shielded room, again proving that the signals are not being transmitted by any form of electromagnetic energy. This field phenomenon was starting to call attention from all over the world. Since then, there have been many more scientists and researchers who have dedicated their lives to studying this work, and their countless findings are enough to have created quite a substantial impact in the scientific community, which is not an easy feat, mind you. Yet still, somehow the mainstream media doesn't like talking about these things and view field theory as somewhat a black box topic. And there are some common guesses as to why that is. Of course, this is the likely point that the skeptics will jump out of the woodwork and say, it's not a conspiracy, it's just been debunked. And as we've looked at this, this is what we've found. When someone does an experiment, their own thoughts and intentions have an effect on the outcome of the experiment too, including the intention to disprove it. And so the scientists observing the experiments, even if they're on the other side of a shielded room, still affect the experiment. The Mythbusters actually demonstrated this perfectly. However, in their follow-up tests with an EEG, they found no effect at all, leading them to believe that the myth was busted. What they didn't consider, however, was that their very mental presence around the experiment was far greater than the energy of, say, the catapulted eggs. And thus there was no reaction from the Drusina because it was tuned to the individuals who were paying such close attention to it, regardless of electromagnetic shielding. This is typical across the board in repeat experiments which profess to disprove the effect. Further, the Global Consciousness Project, which was collaborated on by about 100 researchers and scientists through the Institute of Noetic Sciences, also proved this by showing that when someone does an experiment, their own thoughts and intentions have a massive effect on the outcome of the experiment, including, again, the intention to disprove it. And so that classic saying, whether you think you can or you can't, either way you're correct, is now truer than ever. All of this leads us to believe quite strongly that, ultimately, 
The cells of all living things are in constant communication with each other, so much so that when one is in distress, the surrounding life literally shares in the experience. So when we're in a crowd of stressed or unhappy people versus a crowd of happy and uplifting friends, well, I'm certain you could imagine the difference of the experience. But remember, as with the scientists testing the Baxter effect, the strongest energy wins. If you're around unhappy people, but you choose to be in such a great mood regardless, you will in turn uplift them. Now, taking it even further, Baxter looked at food and realized that one of his plants would respond in stress when he was eating. He found that the consciousness of all of the plants were so actively aware of their fellow companion being eaten that they exhibited signs of fear. This takes the whole being conscious of what you eat phenomenon to a whole nother level. So what can we actually eat without causing harm to anything? Baxter's tests actually have also found the answer to this question. He discovered that if you were to think and feel extreme gratitude for whatever it was that you were about to eat, sending love for all of the people and those involved to bring it together to make this dish for you, and even the earth itself for growing all of the food was key. Expressing thanks and blessings before you eat it or cook your food significantly reduces all signs of distress in the food itself and thereby in the surrounding field as well. Baxter said it was as though the food would then accept its role in your life as nourishment for your body and then essentially surrenders itself to this destiny willingly. Amazing, isn't it? And this is just the tip of the iceberg. We haven't even gotten started yet. So stay tuned and see you next time.